lucky to have known him since he was uh, young and youthful before becoming so dignified and professorial, which he has and has gone on to achieve such great things. Um, uh, President Scott Cohen, as you know, has uh, shaped a very distinct research project uh, from the convergence of architectural typology, projected geometry, contemporary spatial production, and new media. He is the first prize winner of the competition to design the new building for the Tel Aviv Museum of Art, which received a, 90, uh, a 2004 Progressive Architecture Award. Among his most recent acclaimed projects are the Montague House and Taurus House, which also uh, won the Progressive Architecture Awards of 1998 and 2000, Goodman House 2003, and uh, which uh, was shortlist uh, proposal for the uh, Temporary Museum of Modern Art in Long Island City, New York, and the second stage competition proposal for the IBEAM Museum of uh, Art and Technology in New York, 2001. Uh, Scott Cohen is author of Contested Geometries uh, and Other Predicaments in Architecture, a book that I, I recommend to you uh, very much, published by uh, Princeton Architectural Press 2001. And uh, he has a book called Permutations of Descriptive Geometry forthcoming. I think what is, uh, what is uh, very interesting for those of you, again, who are familiar with the work of, uh, of the late Robin Evans, there are uh, very obvious uh, connections between the work of Robin Evans and, uh, and that of uh, President Scott Cohen. Uh, Scott has uh, exhibited his uh, work at uh, many galleries and museums, including the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Fogg Museum of Art at Harvard, and uh, many others. Uh, President Scott Cohen is the Gerald M. McHugh Professor of Architecture and Director of the Masters in Architecture Program at Harvard University Graduate School of Design. He holds the 2004 Frank Gehry International Visiting Chair at the University of Toronto and was the 2002 Perloff Visiting Professor at the University of California, Los Angeles. Please welcome President Scott Cohen. Thank you, Mosin, and um, it's wonderful to be back. And I'm thrilled that Homa just made it, <laughs> barely. <laughs> so um, anyway, um, tonight I'm going to talk about well, something I usually do, which is uh, what I would like to call a possible discovery of a relationship between architecture and geometry, um, one in which um, they agitate and alter one another the motive is to uncover problems, what I would like to call problems, to solve them in such a way that the problem that was put, set out, is left in a, uh, a kind of provisional state of, 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 of being uh, un unsteady, unsolved, and uh, to finally bring about a kind of resolution whereby the discordance inherent to the conflict um, forces uh, the creation of, of unanticipated forms. Um, now, this desire for seemingly insoluble problems of geometry arises, in my case, from what I would like to call a sublimation complex, a self-imposed imperative to reconcile, as I said, the geometric problems by means of disguising it as a solution. The conflation problem solution in modern architecture is a is in a way something like what I call perverse functionality, the condition in which something performs its function under difficult conditions even better than it would had it performed under normal conditions. Um, thus, in modern architecture, there are so many examples of peculiar forms which uh, bring about new configurations of living and so forth. Um, but before returning to the modern preoccupations with function, I'd like to begin by rehearsing a classical case of a problem that leads to an unanticipated solution. A problem solved ingeniously, in this case, by Bramante at San Santa Maria Presso San Saturo, unable to manifest a complete Latin cross plan due to the limitations of the site, Vermonte resorts to an illusion, solving the problem with perspective in relief. Thus, three-dimensional space is conflated 
with two-dimensional perspective. You all know this very well. And what we have is a remarkable synthesis of painterly anamorphosis and architectural space, in this case merged in an exceptional configuration instigated by necessity. In fact, it is quite clear that this is the case since Bermonte does not resort to illusion making in, in the rest of his projects. Um, now, also interesting here, though, is something that is a byproduct of this, which is that if anamorphosis is the most extreme case in which painting imitates architecture, though that is by co-opting the gallery space in a game of hide-and-seek, you know, by superimposing the oblique onto the frontal, then Bermantes and Satoro is, in a way, architecture imitating painting when it imitated architecture. Thus, this double inversion, again, is an effect. Now, this whole problem of geometry, this space of illusion, it calls forth an entire discipline, that of projective geometry. Let's see if we can do this. Here you'll be seeing Desargues' theorem. Now, projective geometry previously had been instrumental only for stereotomic constructive purposes, never meant for the instigation and sublimation of architectural predicaments. We're going to run out of power here. How convenient. Um, <laughs> maybe I can get some for us back. Anyway, projective geometry. The, um, got it right here. Um, anyway, the projective function necessitates a certain form of elasticity, one that becomes evident when you witness these transformations in the animation. Those kinds of conditions of elasticity that in architecture would be arbitrary are ca caused by external conditions, such as those that we were looking at in Bermonte's project. Um, here, in projective geometry, it's interesting to note that there are, as you know, these planes, these planes we call the planes of projection, that are able to be congruent with architecture because necessary as they are to the projective function, they are, as you know very well, somehow very much related to the inexorable problems of function that bring about such planes in the architectural context. Now, we can speak about a relationship between geometry and architecture <clears throat> implicitly united in such a procedure, but what is united in practice is obviously separated in theory. In geometrical method, a postular axiom is a necessary fiction. Methodology derives from a step-by-step -step construction. The subsequent builds on the previous and so forth. Method provides a basis for knowledge and error is verifiable. Needless to say, this is not the case in architecture. <laughs> architecture, in a way, is the betrayal of geometry. Yet, according to a very, uh, well, I would say naive, but unfortunately widespread view, the architecture-geometry relationship is conceived of in terms of the importation of shapes or models from geometry into architecture, even as this distinction arises. Geometry, we have the potential for verification, whereas in architecture, you do not have this option, except metaphorically. So what is the relationship between this impossibility and the constitution of architecture? The difference between Bermonte's situation and most we face today is that his problem began with a formal necessity, the imperative to produce the Latin cross and ours does not ever, frankly, begin with a formal necessity. We have to come up with those ourselves.
here I will show you one that I put out there as a way to introduce uh, for myself a difficulty that would lead back to the problem of function that I spoke of at the beginning. How is it that in the absence of any a priori formal demands, do we create them where they do not exist and solve them to bring about that perverse functionality? In this project, there is the demand that I impose to create a self-intersecting line, this line, if you follow it on both ends, intersects with itself. And it does so under the condition that it is generated by two intersecting cylinders and an intersecting cone. Um, this is periodized so that here we're seeing two periods, two full cycles of the period um, with a kind of uh, micro logic of the period allowing it to be altered elastically to contend with certain conditions in the program. But in any case, this genesis of this uh, line by forms that are antithetical to the very nature of that line is of great interest. In a way, what is happening here is a certain geometry, that of the cones and the cylinders, is being used in a very disciplined way to create the effects of a disagreeable geometry, that of topology. Um, now, how is it that this problem is of interest here, given the <laughs> initial statement I made? It's of interest if only because it, if the demand is made to put such things together and generate a line, it must be done this way. Now, there are variations on, ha on this particular configuration, but this intersection, which is brought about here, is of such a kind that these bolts must produce this certain kind of saddled condition that the generator of this cone must be tangent to a perpendicular generator on one of those and so forth. And so this form is brought without very much voluntary, uh, let's say, intervention. And once it is, one works within the limitations it imposes and a project is, is, is made. Now, then we have to work backwards and make sense of it and a certain kind of program emerges. So what of this perverse functional thesis? <laughs> it just so happens, conveniently, that we are working with a client who asked for a very strange scenario. He asked that he could inhabit various spaces in the house in such a way that he would be heard but not seen from one to another on certain occasions when visitors, primarily young children, his grandchildren might be in. So he can be in a room there, back there, and not have this sensation of living in a house among phantoms that he's unaware of, but nonetheless have a, a sense of privacy that the visual, uh, the, the denial of any visual access brings about, brings about. And this, of course, is something like the problem of the Baroque speaker, um, though, you know, it too, uh, uh, I mean, because of the way in which it links interior spaces and creates a kind of sonic a connection without visual uh, connection. This obviously goes back to a problem that I had re earlier looked at in this sacristy in Rome, since uh, the sacristy at San Carlo at Catanari, where a crisis at the corner necessitated an extraordinary concealment. Um, perhaps the whole idea of this sublimation that I spoke of at the beginning, the attempt to disguise a problem as a solution begins here. What happens, the corner of the building is pierced. In order to avoid the problem of extruding a, 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 an embrasure from an interior diagonal corner and introducing a crisis which was prohibited, to solve two problems simultaneously, this is what was done. The embrasure was rotated and the opening into it is on the side of it in there. Um, it solves two problems. It allows the coexistence of the external organization of, facade, of the facades and the interior to develop according to its own rules in a kind of synthesis which leads to, again, back to this thesis of the perversely functional. Because here, what ends up happening is a whole series of, well, 
hypothesis on my part about a whole series of geometrical devices with which to bring about congruency among a series of ellipses that are produced through intersections of so many tubes generated from the inside that need to be related to one another on the outside according to a whole series of rules and so forth. And what we get in the end is a source of light extremely indirect and diffuse in a way Concealing the source of light is the goal of so many of these embrasures and such sacristies, but here it's even more concealed than in any of the others, thus producing the effect even better than it would normally do so had the embrasure merely extruded to the exterior directly. You understand these very deep embrasures do make difficult evidence of the, uh, the source of light, but in this case it's even more difficult to discern the source because it's, uh, the window is diagonally opening into a an embrasure that's been rotated 90 degrees to that opening. So <laughs> it, 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 while it's trying to resolve predicaments of geometry in the canon of the classical language, not to interfere with that canon, and, and thereby, by the way, raising it to a higher level, bringing the discipline of projective geometry into uh, a relationship with the classical, which had not been before there, although, by the way, it wasn't there. This is a hypothesis. There is no evidence that the, any of these uh, folks <laughs> who speak in southern jargon would be uh, would be working on such things would be ha would have had at their disposal the, the instruments of projective geometry. There is no evidence of this at all. In fact, it appears they wouldn't have had it. But it is, in my view, uh, implicit that uh, projective geometry is unified with the the classical canon in an unusual way, solving this predicament about the light source. Um, now, this is a segue, this whole problem of voids, their extrusion through so much mass into the toroidal projects. I'll show you a few of these. Um, the torus condition in architecture for me is extraordinary because it is a condition in which a unity is already dual, a kind of singular duality, wherein the core evinces a congruent du duality between mutually exclusive spaces of equal weight. And thus, no matter which side of the surface one is on, one is in the same condition of space, but one utterly divided, you know, from the other side. And no matter where one is, all of it seems to be mass or void simultaneously. It's a kind of homogeneity of space, which is produced by division rather than, in, you know, kind of inter intermingling as in the modern uh, canon, modernist solution that we know from Mies, for example. So it's a kind of spatial impasse. And it too leads to exceptional functional scenarios, mainly because you can't get from one side of the surface to the other in any logical way. So the architect who aims to make sense of it, and one has to be doing that to end up with anything <laughs> perversely functional, um, to break from one side to the other, break through, or to exploit the difference of the two sides, something has to be done in the scenario. And in this case, what happens, for example, is that one passes directly through this void in the center of the house to the roof. And in so doing, bypasses the entire interior. It's the kind of interval and a threshold between the roof and ground landscapes. Interesting because in this place is an artist who will enjoys mainly one of his primary uh, needs in a way. He's a, a kind of voyeuristic and very, he wouldn't mind me saying so, uh, self-conscious uh, artist who, who likes to uh, have parties on his roof. And so as in the scenario in the summer when one passes through the whole house on the way to an event in a backyard where it, whereby the entire interior is something one is a voyeur inhabiting only temporarily on their way to that event back out, out back. This is the same thing, but rotated 90 degrees. So one is in a way passing through the whole house, you know, uh, on their way to the, the main event. But here it's, of course, made a far more extreme uh, version of that scenario. All of the functions have to be sort of forced to the periphery. Here again, another case where interlocking uh, tor toroidal conditions are, are, are used for particular ends that are programmatic. In this case, it was given that there would be in the I-beam um, atelier competition, that there would be two programs constantly contiguous and, and, and related, an educative uh, program and a, and a, um, a kind of um, exhibition 
program. And what we <laughs> did, basically this is in a way a series of the house at the beginning I showed you, the Wu house, uh, many of those in a way vertically or oriented, um, and laced through by a totalizing system, which is itself permutable, which is a kind of Snelson tensegrity system. And what happens is the, the circulation elements, primarily the escalators and the structural system, cohabitate in these tubes, these voids, which bypass every other floor. It's one of those diagrams today that many of us are fascinated by. I'm quite aware that many are. This, in case you basically go up, I'm sorry, you, if you begin, let's start here with this escalator. You go up, you pass a floor, you're on this level, then you pass a floor, you pass a floor. And when you come back down this ramp, you get to the next set of escalators, the green ones, passing every other floor again on the way back down, all floors having been missed on the way up or seen on the way down. And all of the tubes present the illusion that they are, let's say, passing through so much mass and in fact, as you find out later, all of it is void. And again, we have that extreme condition. Interesting reflection on the problem of the Guggenheim, where the double sequence, the up and the down, are utterly divorced experiences, as you know, in the Guggenheim of right, you ascend an elevator. It's one of the options is to ascend and then descend via the ramp, so that the ascent and descent are utterly ex mutually exclusive experiences. But here the problem is that, of course, that's a quite hierarchically distinguished coupling. And what one also ends up with is an entire museum caught up in the geometry of the premise, not the most convenient uh, organization or the most flexible, though the most, one of the most exquisite that I know. Um, so these are, are, in a way, temporary disruptions of an otherwise open plan which also would be permutable if one were to consider from the beginning that the tensegrity system could be uh, rendered in different organizations depending on which one makes the most sense, although admittedly any of them will freeze a less flexible plan than, uh, let's say, an extruded columnar system would. Um, when such diagonals occur, though, there would be partitions, or they would invite the introduction of such things as partitions. Um, now, In the case of the, um, of the I-beam, what also is of interest is this reflection on the problem of projection once again. Of course, we see that the tubes have been sliced, and in a way what we are understanding these planes to be is something like a series of cutting planes or projection planes, depending on which of the elements we're, we're analyzing. Um, in a way, the whole building has been sliced, and it reveals or helps to give evidence to the generation of the lineaments which are come about from the intersection of the cones and cylinders that we were looking at in the earlier house, and here we see in another permutation. The idea that the cutting plane, uh, let's say, helps us to, um, helps the intellection of form in some way, and simultaneously is required, obviously for programmatic purposes is of interest to me, because it is always a problem to deal with such geometries and introduce truly horizontal planes and truly vertical, truly plumb planes. Many of you, I'm sure, have experienced this conundrum that the, that the geometry of functional architecture, once again, is in disagreement with the kinds of complex geometry we are presently, uh, very many of us, absorbed in. Um, so the, whole, the idea here is that it is necessary in a way, rather than an arbitrary intervention by the functional demands of architecture into the geometrical uh, research. Um, the project ends by being made physical in a model for Greg Lynn's exhibition on intricacy. <coughs> um, of course, it exhibits these strange phenomena, uh, strange uh, effects with, to do with its scalelessness. Another of the uh, uh, 
areas of interest that uh, comes about when one is dealing with these types of geometry. Now, uh, this is the uh, another project, uh, a house, uh, the Goodman House. We're back here with the problem of the single void, as in the Taurus House. But in this case, as in I-beam, the space is filled with a structure. Only this time, the structure is not Snelson's consecrity. It's a 19th century barn frame, disassembled, moved, and re-erected. Um, what, what we have here is um, the, uh, the theme of singularity again. The client desi a desire that the whole thing be a single space actually dedicated to dining, or something like a dining hall. Now, it was hoped that the entire interior would be as with, is unfettered, as devoid of partitions as possible. This extreme continuity and openness brought about a series of interesting problems. Now, one of the things, though, that happens here is that the whole house is as if an inversion of the relationship we all had known um, between the interior structures of such agricultural buildings and their envelopes. If the barn had once been a kind of iconic gable form, this is all too ubiquitous today, and what one really wants to see is all that used to be hidden, which is this uh, structural system inside. The structural system, in a way, is overexposed now, and the gable form is something uh, taken for granted. So the effort here has been to turn the outside in um, because of this very problem, this thematic, or to make that the thematic. Um, that everything inside now is exposed. And um, emptying it um, means making, let's say, evident the removal of mass once again. So this tube of space passes through the building, though in this case it's a horizontal toroid. Now we have another thing on our plate here, which is that we're not dealing with the, the curves of the toroid. We are only dealing with the spatial uh, premise to, in the architectural context. It's orthogonally corrected here, obviously. Um, now, the project begins with the rotation of the primary axis, but what is of interest, sorry, I want to show you one thing, is that the barn itself displays some unusual conditions, and you'll have to bear with me while I show you the, the most important one, which is that this is a four bay structure, a pure Dutch barn, and it had had an addition made, which was uh, exceptional. And what we have then, strangely, is a nave, which is the width of this addition. I'm sorry, this is not correct. The, the height of the nave is the same as the height of this uh, added uh, bay but the width of the aisles is the same as the width of this. So what we end up with is something like an addition which is, the, is simultaneously the synthesis of the aisle and the nave rotated 90 degrees. And so the tube takes its place in that particular bay, giving, let's say, uh, justifying after the fact something that would otherwise be irrelevant. And brings about a rotation which, and by the way, anglifies the Dutch barn because the axes of Dutch barns normally would run along the axis of the, uh, of the nave. So what, what happens here is a plan is, is put in, a bar, the, the rooms are all compressed as in the Taurus house to the perimeter, but forced to push down and around and around. In a way, there's a rotation set up in the plan due to the introduction of that tube which already had something to do with the rotation of the axis. This is a strange space. It's a winter garden, a breezeway, a covered bridge. It's suspended over another space. <coughs> and of course, the exterior coming in. It is a smooth space, uninterrupted by the structure. It is the only space like that. While the rest of the space, as I said, is as if a kind of outside-in condition. 
a kind of pochet that's been overexposed and half re inhabited. This, you will see, is a barn which had been moved, as I said, from quite far away, re erected. And then there was the problem of stabilizing and having emptied it when it had been that so many mezzanines and partitions would have stabilized it, although barns can move anyway in the wind. They sway in the breeze. This is on the top of a mountain now, <laughs> uh, open and very vulnerable. The question was to introduce uh, you know, a supplementary structure that would permeate the entire interior, reinforcing all its joints, destroying the very integrity that one was seeking to behold and to fetishize. So the choice was to enclose it entirely in a cage. And this steel structure then would allow a whole new envelope with its own structural system. And in a way, it's this uh, kind of, um, well, segregation of systems, bringing about a kind of curtain wall, which is more compatible than in a commercial building context than in a domestic context. And this is what I guess makes this house a very modern house. Um, and, that's of interest, that this emptying required this excessive structural uh, idea. And so it's, it's several things that have happened in a way. The anomalousness of the bay, something like the exception of that corner the, in the sacristy, the problem of turning outside in, which was now, I understand, only a, thema a, theme, a thematic idea, and the multiplicity of structural conditions which allows for, in this case, a freedom to, to have apertures where one needs them and so forth, which themselves follow another system. Um, the phenomenon of the void here, I think, is quite extraordinary in the sense that it gives definition to these two spaces, as I said, as, as if they are alike, but uh, divided. And, uh, and not uh, one in the same functionally whatsoever. Interestingly here, a kind of timbre-like door rises up out of this guillotine-like flying in the interior space to preserve the integrity of the envelope. It's almost finished, this project. But here, and here you see the kind of vortexical effect of the, uh, wrote, wrote, uh, given the, um, the position of apertures on all surfaces alike. Um, normally, you know, the, the structure and, and, and relationship between structure and discrete aperture have a relationship of non-interference, while here, interior and exterior are framed alike, and structure enters, is, is a kind of intervening element. Um, this is an exciting effect brought about by the, of course, the desire for larger apertures, uninterrupted views, which can only be had from certain diagonal positions, given that the, the, the bays that are given by the barn uh, disallow any uh, direct or uh, very large openings. Many times they're crossed, <laughs> views are barred, as in that last example. But the overall effect is a surprising, you know, displacement. Of course, in many of these barns, that is true. I believe, though, here the estrangement of the apertures from the from the structural um, organization makes it all the more so. Um, oddly, this uh, problem of the <laughs> aperture uh, makes its way into this project. This is the project for the Tel Aviv Museum. In fact, it has the pattern that I designed for that project that it could not be deployed there as well as it will be this case, I think. But here, the, we're back to the vertical orientation of the, of the uh, toroidal uh, center. And though here, I would say the analogy with the compluvium is back, like in the Taurus house, um, a hole in the roof. This is in the center of the cultural complex uh, of Tel Aviv. And this is an existing museum, which this will now almost double in size. This is almost this is around 20,000 square meters, uh, largely uh, half underground. And there is a garden, an existing garden, which will uh, make uh, the union between the two through a connecting element, which I'll tell you more about. But So it's an autonomous museum with its own uh, capacity to function independently while having this uh, distinctive connection to the original. 
Um, now this void, in this case, is serving a very interesting purpose. It is an opening which is extrapolated downward by ruled surfaces in such a way that its uh, its um, orientation in changing from the top to the bottom is following along with its, well, let's say is being made possible by or is at one with the galleries in the building. It was required that the building have a series of very large, flexible, rectangular galleries, 600 square meters each, most of them, and that they not be anything other than rectangular. A perfect problem for me to put squares into a round, <laughs> square pegs in a round hole, in this case, so some mini rectangles into a triangular site. And this element in the center of the building rotates according to the position of these galleries as they take different uh, uh, alignments uh, with the site. The 45 degree angle of the site, which you see on the upper left, adheres to one set of galleries. The 90 degrees back at the beginning adheres to the organization on the right, which is the existing building. And a 22 and a half degree angle is introduced as a compromise. The aim here to soften the blow to somehow, let's say, diminish the direct conflict which so many other buildings have exploited between so many angles in the site is quite a noisy visual condition in this site. I'll call it noisy because it's a very clamorous uh, kind of uh, architectural setting um, that I had hoped to not uh, contribute to. The building then is trying to synthesize this, uh, this um, conflict of the angles, um, again, to soften, to sublimate what would normally be exploited as architectural energy of some kind, I suppose, by some of the other buildings. And the outside is also doing that. It is in itself rotating in a somewhat, well, in quite a different way, but in a related way to that core on the interior. Now, what else does this core do? It not only does it allow the synthesis of these opposing conditions in the site with the rectangular volumes inside, it becomes a means, again, to transmit light to a building, in a building where it must be brought quite low due to, this is just a, a model of it, uh, due to the, the, the over uh, the extension, of, I mean, the extended uh, program, which is not really, um, it's, uh, the site is not commodious, it's not sufficiently commodious for this, this program. And so this uh, compluvium shaft allows many of the important spaces to be below the terrace level, and it reflects light downward to them. It also disguises the, the distance by, in a way, extending it. That is, well, because it's rotating this way, it becomes quite, I, I think, uh, unclear which angle one is experiencing vis-a-vis -vis the other side of the court of this light well. Altogether, the relationship between the top and the bottom of the building is made quite ambiguous by this element. Um, here you're seeing uh, on the far right the most stable of the plans. This is the top plan, three large 600 square meter galleries. The other um, idea which helped to make possible an exterior that would behave as does the inside was to uh, go against something which is a tendency, particularly in Israel, which is this kind of uh, bunkering of these buildings, very solid, very opaque. These buildings, uh, there is no contact between the inside and the outside in many of these large institutions. Um, an existing building is almost completely a solid exterior. What I did was to have these rooms rotate that way to pull most of these, the surfaces out of the heart of the building. They're all in this zone between the museum, which is this part of the building, and the education piece of the program. Pulling it out left space for that compluvium, that, that vortexical space. But also it allowed then that the perimeter of the building would be lined by the curatorial departments and uh, in this case by the lobby and restaurants and other things. So the, the building on its edges is porous and these containers are mainly embedded. 
The sequence around this element is of interest because that while it seems to be the whole organizational device for the building, the, the way in which one happens upon it is not as direct as it would at first appear in the plans to be. Um, here is the sequence into the, um, the initial lobby and then being ticketed, post-ticketed lobby here. One ascends a ramp here, can move through all these galleries um, and or continue up and arrive at this point to go through these galleries. There are a number of ways to do it, of course. Um, basically, though, there are two independent sequences that are brought together at that part, at that uh, piece in the middle. From the other museum, one arrives by an escalator and ascends all the way to this point to begin the, to commence the itinerary in this series of galleries. So this entrance is more dedicated to this floor, while this from the original building is dedicated to this floor because the building really is two museums in one. They have divided it that way. This is a, these galleries are all dedicated to design and architecture and these are contemporary Israeli art and then temporary uh, exhibitions on a lower floor, bringing together disparate uh, sequences and into relation with the elevator and services and, 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 and in some way coherently engaged with the, this uh, light space was really one of the primary aims in all of what you're seeing here. Um, as it descends, it just gets thicker and thicker with all of those services. Um, but this kind of postponement of arrival or what this aleatory kind of sequence is somehow made evident in a view like this where upon entering it is evident that there are galleries that are very near but as one moves through discovers not so easily accessed unless one takes quite a tour to get to them. In fact, we're looking at one that only is arrived to quite late or here a view across a space which asks that one move a certain way potentially at some later point to arrive in a gallery very nearby but uh, still not uh, evidently so accessible from this point. But also interesting here is to notice, for example, the parallelism of those two galleries in an utterly different orientation than these um, so that as one moves through the perspective and, and relationship with the site is, is so, so much changing that the sense of what its shape is is a quite an elusive, uh, elusive uh, anticipation. This is showing how the section then is exploiting this uh, central element with it. You know, galleries, for example, here which are dedicated to pre-war period have much smaller works and need to be lower than those than in the post-war period. Here we have the contemporary side reversed and the low ones there and this kind of low Sian section is able to work itself out that way. Now under the rubric of the idea of an old-fashioned dome, the relationship between this surface of this light space and the outside facade is something like the inner and outer shell of a dome, or in this case it's more like a lantern though because it's suspended over a space. It doesn't meet the ground. I mean, unlike, for example, in the case of the Guggenheim where it's very, you know, has a very distinctive relationship, you know, to the top, which is a dome, and the bottom. This is suspended and it treats top and bottom alike. Uh, this, uh, of course, recalls that torus effect. This is a kind of inversely symmetrical figure, by the way, which gives it a certain kind of coherence, which is highly guarded compared to the outside, which is more contingent, the outside twisting uh, envelope. Now, all of the surfaces are ruled. None of these surfaces are in, in any other uh, kind. Uh, they are, every one of them, a four rail uh, is, is based in four rails. This allows for us to reduce the number of types of curvature so that when we manufacture, which is the plan right now, um, cast uh, concrete panels for the cladding for the building, they can be based in a certain set of curvatures and we can thereby uh, minimize the problem of having to reintroduce whole different constructions for every single setting. Um, 
interestingly, again, the constraint of a very limited geometrical palette that creates, you know, effects that are far more expansive is, is of interest here. The idea of being so constrained and the proliferation of effects from the constraint. But the constraint is both a self-imposition and one which in this case is efficient. Here you, you can see that the, how it works. I mean, if I were to show you one of those four rails, so it becomes very evident here. You can see an absolute horizontal edge and an absolute vertical, and here are the, uh, the two opposing rails. That, right, that surface is not unlike any other. Of course, we have here just a plumb. We have many uh, uh, normal surfaces as well. What happens here because of that uh, orient reorientation is that this whole element is as if inclined, and it moves around the building, this inclination to accentuate the kind of rotation that's implicit in that core space, and also to accelerate or decelerate its perspectives of the building as you moved around it, the most important one being from here, the entrance to the old building back there, when one views the building from there, it seems foreshortened. It's a kind of inverse perspective. But it's brought about by that rotation and in a way a new configuration of cornice, which is not really a cornice, but really the difference between two angles in plan. So this subtle rotation is yet another angle, by the way, not related to the three I showed you inside, um, but a whole set of dimensions that are only belonging to the exterior. This uh, kind of reorientation of this whole block makes, for example, the entrance, which is aligned in a very classical, even very Beaux-Arts way, I will, I will go that far to say, with uh, this, this uh, hideous uh, plaza of the Opera House, um, which I'm not showing there. Uh, this is the, <laughs> this is the uh, education side of the building, the only occasion where the whole of the envelope is sliced uh, out and uh, giving this transparent, this is, a, this is a solution done in a day. So this is not the pattern we'll have for that. Um, <laughs> um, and the structure inside is really a pile of different structures. It's very simple. They simply move about to accommodate the, the very strangely or oriented walls of so many apparently rotating boxes. And the spans will be different. It's not a highly rational system is a very banal solution, frankly. But nonetheless, uh, and this is not a building which, by virtue of its budget, can be anything but banal at the level of structure. Um, it, it, it's interesting to know, only in the case for only for the architect, that uh, it has this kind of, um, let's say, disjunctive collection of elements in it, which remain discrete and, and, and are held together rather than utterly continuous in a way which is impossible, given that, the, for example, the building has to be built in stages. Although the solution to phasing it is quite attractive now, the latest idea being that we will build the entire shell and later finish it out as, as it becomes. Huh, we're not getting any, inner, any um, power here, up here. Happily, we're holding up still. Um, <laughs> here we're beginning at the, you can see that inverse perspective there, but this is a, ga a garden that exists, a pattern which I will not take, assume responsibility for. Thank you. Um, <laughs> this is the, uh, the entrance where, for example, this ramp element, which we have had to add, been forced to add, for, you know, already synonymous with some of these conditions of rotation, anticipating the interior space where ramps are integrated into the geometry of that um, light space. This is a, a kind of space which, because of the way it has been organized by these um, three angles, presents very acute conditions. And in that sense, appears to be something that is more like an inflection or a contingency rather than an autonomous element, until one actually looks into it and sees that it, on its own terms, is completely coherent. Um, 
Now, it's interesting here that the site constraint, the triangularity, in conflict with the rectangular conditions, allows this development to proceed without the need to concoct something like the scenario at the Taurus house, a willful kind of fantasy. Um, what it means, though, is that one, it, the only occasion when one can bring about a problem necessarily is to do it under similar conditions, let's say, found by Bramante. Thinking about that recently, it seemed to me that it would only be in those cases where the site is so constraining that geometry would be put to the test. Somewhat disappointing, since it's rare that a site is as let's say, animating and forceful as it is in this example. So this may be merely a happy coincidence and not an example of a more, of something applicable more widely. I hope that's not true. Or I hope that the imposition of such limits will be very sensible in many different situations, even if the imposition isn't a given. That is, there may be scenarios where one is required to make a building a sort of shape by virtue of a whole set of processes that brings one to the conclusion that it be that shape, and then that one would proceed under those constraints, and that such conditions of, uh, of disagreement in geometries would unfold. Uh, bring back that reference to the, the Guggenheim because, well, what interested me there is that the building, in a way, is the invention of a new typology for the museum, for a museum. It isn't entirely new. In fact, it's an anomalous synthesis of, of incompatible types. It's, in a way, the linear picture gallery, chronological, and the simultaneous, uh, all-present cabinet of curiosity model although here at a very monumental scale, and the entirety of that kind of uh, linearity has been wrapped around to make accessible views into, and, uh, into the cabinet and also allow one to actually inhabit the membrane of the cabinet. Um, that would be a metaphorical description of what happens there, but it isn't that it is self-consciously anything like that, of course. Really, it's an invention that came about because a new mode of exhibiting art seem to be the, the primary point of the building. Uh, that is non-objective art, as it were, was to be exhibited in a new configuration. Um, I don't think in the case of the Tel Aviv Museum it's being asked any, there, are no, there aren't any demands that require a new typology, really. Um, uh, the I-beam project might be one where we, one could make the case, given that it's a building dedicated to new media newness being a fleeting and always changing condition, but leaving that aside, the idea that there is a media for which there is no form to exhibit, um, to exhibit it, uh, is re related distantly to the problem faced by Wright. Um, because we're dealing with something which is far less uh, um, explicitly uh, requiring anything new, uh, there was the, the problem to reflect on what museums do when they do not do that. I, <laughs> here uh, you see the Khan example. Interestingly, the role of that space is one which is to remain, uh, you know, well, it's a kind of useless space, but it isn't one that uh, conjures up the dynamics of right. I somehow see that the space in the middle of the Tel Aviv as being both of those. Um, now, it, just to conclude, I basically am just now working on some forms which really have to do further with the question of the relationship of geometries to one another. In this case, the proliferation of geometries is of interest. I mean, the architect is not only dealing with the relationship between architecture and geometry, but also working between geometries. And this double conundrum uh, really thwarts architecture in an even more vigorous way than any one geometry on its own can. Um, the most difficult, of course, are the non-orientable geometries. I'm not showing many of these, 
that is minimal surfaces. But I am showing you a few discrete cases. The triple point twist, for example, here is unified with some cylinders um, and some cones, um, such that the lineaments that we were looking at earlier are caught up in that geometry unexpectedly. Although the two, by the way, are incompatible to such an extreme that any connection that one would make would be fudged. Oddly enough, what interests me here in this, again, betrayal of geometric uh, verification, uh, verifiability, is that the misfit between geometries is something like the perennial problem of, of, man of material in relationship with geometry, and here it's a problem inherent already. The conflict between one geometry and another is something like the conflict between material and geometry. At another level, though, and here's a model just to demonstrate another question about the fabrication of these things. This is merely a stereolithographic model, but the processes that bring those things out, um, this kind of strange um, roughness, which is necessary given the polygonal uh, uh, low resolution of this model. Um, there is, you know, another conflict, which of course reminds, in a way, of the uh, brutalist phenomenon. That is the rough hewnness uh, in, the, in the material manifestation of geometries that are presumably utterly smooth at the level of their, of their conceptual makeup. What we're looking at here, by the way, is the synthesis of a, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the unity of a cap cross cap with a triple point twist. They're joined on a single line. I'm going to show this to you. I had a diagram of it. Ah, we'll get to it in a minute. And in that, they are brought together very, very distinctively, but in no other way transformed. It's just that by virtue of sharing one line, the line most important to both of their generation, um, it, uh, it produces a kind of coherent, uh, uh, coherent implication. Um, the cones, again, with the triple point twist, here a double. The interesting thing here is that the line that I'm referring to, and here I think you can see, see it best there, it's a line that's inherent to the triple point twist, in this case joined with the intersection between the cone, which you see down here, and these two um, cones. <coughs> this is a very wide open cone. This line, um, of, uh, where by degrees of similar curvature, appear to contradict, appear to transcend the contradiction between these uh, geometries, is really only an illusion possible in architecture when, as I said, the fabrication would perfect the imperfection of these lines. That is, it would perfectly hide it. By virtue of the roughness and the expectable in in misfit between construction and geometry, any disagreement in the pure resolution of the geometry would be also uh, hidden. Um, I, I hadn't really drawn this to a conclusion. The only point I wanted to make was that it seemed to me this was leading into something that I, I'd like to think of as a kind of coherency which is brought to a very extreme level where the geometries are putting such a demand on the total shaping of the work that more than anything the evidence of this kind of hyper or supercharged coherence is the thematic of the work. Um, it requires a method of working that doesn't have to be publicly disseminated and that perhaps is only to be done that treated that way in an audience, a very ex a good audience, <laughs> the best perhaps, an audience like this. So um, I welcome any questions about it. Thank you very much. trying to understand, I have a question about the, uh, some of the things that you said at the beginning, which was really about the relationship between geometry and architecture. And uh, talking about the example of certain built projects and the question of embrasures. Mm -hmm. 
And in many of those early projects, which are probably m more simple initially, um, the, the kinds of relationships that are constructed through, for example, interventions or insertions and so on are uh, very um, directly kind of noticeable or visible. Now, the more that you are working towards these later stages and the project becomes, um, develops more and more of the rules in relation to itself, it seems there's also a kind of moment of pure plasticity some way where the piece, like the pieces at the end that you were showing, they actually return to the, to the sculptural almost in, the, in, that, in that sense of uh, pure plasticity because they become self-referential in, in, in themselves. Whereas, um, for example, with the Baroque ear, it's a very specific device of, of a, a form, but at the same time, a, a kind of auditory situation of linking two conditions and the shock that comes from, as you try to do with that, with that house, with the, with the grandfather. So I'm just wondering about this, this uh, probably the question that I have is when you say at the end you're working towards this idea of the constraints, wondering whether it doesn't become in, in its, uh, in its, in its uh, kind of totality, this purely self-referential kind of project, where, whereas in the other ones it is much more contingent, localized, and in a sense much more negotiative, if we can say, say that. Um, and I, I wonder if you have some observations about this. Well, first of all, for, for me, what, interests, what is of interest in the sacristy is not only that, I mean, it does that, that it is a local and very distinctive solution to this very bizarre problem, but in the end, first of all, I don't think it would rotate except for the, 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 the problem of the provocation to, to work against the, can the classical canon, which was an obstacle. The pilaster at the corner of the building, which was truly arbitrarily related to the interior, required that it rotate. So it's a formal resolution that it rotates as such, while simultaneously it serves this very interesting um, effect produce this very interesting effect. In lieu of what would be that idea, that such an element would be both solving a problem which is purely formal and functional, I, I, we don't, in lieu of the formal side of this equation, I am aim to produce conditions of form that necessitate certain relationships. So for example, the only way I can get that line is to put the cones and the, and the uh, cylinders together a certain way. They have in that way with each other. They can move to some degree, but by the, but for example, if you, you, know, you invert the relationship with those two cones, the line will invert and the intersection will, will literally disappear. We'll go on the other side again. So there are certain kinds of forms that can only produce certain other forms. And then the question is, what can they do for me? <laughs> and for example, in the last projects, I have no idea yet but they are the kinds of research that would lead to creating something like the middle of the television project, which is a symmetrical synthesis of certain angles and minimal surfaces that generates in a very particular way that condition. The thing in the middle of the television therefore has an autonomous life, utterly self-referential, and a completely contingent life because it is directly engaged by those galleries bringing light in a very particular way at certain points in the sequence. So what I would argue is the sacristy and in the Tel Aviv, there is a form, whether it's the, can the classical canon, the system of the ellipses and so forth in the, in the sacristy, or the, you know, the rule surfaces, and then there are those conditions that it affects or begets, uh, supposedly even better than other forms that are less self-contained wood, self-possessed wood, I would say. I would say the sacristy is a highly self-possessed geometrical construct, actually. I mean, if you isolate the condition of the speaker alone, it's not. But if you look at that ellipse and all the other ellipses that are, it, it is bound up with to produce patterns of symmetry, and the other embrasures, by the way, which also have to rotate and do certain things to, to make a kind of total uh, coherent organization out of, the, out of the whole project. It's pretty interesting that they're all one thing. 
And the other thing I wanted to ask you is with the, with the museum, the actual relationship between these geometries and the way in which then you are constructing, a, in a sense, a different experience of the, of the, of the work. Yeah. Because uh, I wasn't quite sure, when you show something like the Guggenheim, yeah. or, or, and then the Kant thing, now with your own project, what, how are you, how are you, uh, how do you feel the project, in a sense, Readdresses this question of the relationship to the, to the work. I mean, to, to like in terms of the conception of the museum, are you trying to set up a different way of looking at the work as well, or you mean looking at, at the, works at the, in the museum? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm limited in my ability to do that. I mean, it would be, for example, the whole typology of the museum in a way is predetermined, which is a problem with many museums today. Um, and we, we I, I've tried to negotiate with. About it, but as you may know, many museums would like to leave the court, the I'm sorry, the um, the curatorial configuration extremely flexible. So these are huge, undivided spaces that will rarely remain as undivided as, as they were, for example, in this animation. Only in certain exhibitions, normally they'll be partitioned, reconfigured in different ways. So my capacity really to manipulate the effects of exhibits exhibiting anything is limited only to the way in which I bring light in, the syncopation, for example, that light, the point of entry, the adjacency of the view to an exterior condition or to this light space, but it's quite minimal in a way. And, and as you know, some of these museums, architects are only left to design the public parts of them. But by putting these blocks of space in such, well, I don't know what kind of arrangement you want to call that, whatever mm -hmm. that is, <laughs> the public space has so many contacts with it, with those uh, exhibitions, that the architect is doing more than if one divide, bifurcated the building into public and gallery, like the way, for example, it is in a museum like the MoMA, where all of the public space is in the back. It's a big warehouse of galleries. Mm -hmm. The warehousing of the galleries, though, is the most efficient solution. Happily, this geometry of this site makes it hard for them to have it. <laughs> the site protects me from having to give in to that. And, and the other thing that's interesting, talking about protections, is that, uh, well, there are other resistances. It, 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 there are many ways to resist, I think, through geometry. Uh, I'll give you one. Sorry. <laughs> one of the things is interesting, you'll like this, I think, most, which is that, for example, they would like the building to look like the other buildings in Tel that are trying to imitate the. the the Safdie-esque uh, Jerusalemization of Tel Aviv. Safdie-esque Jerusalemization. <laughs> Which is, I've never put it that way. Anyway, it's something to do with bringing the stones of uh, Jerusalem into Tel Aviv. Sure. Tel Aviv's always been stucco and concrete mm. cast. Concrete mm. cast. And so they bring you know, all these horrible new buildings, which are you know, <laughs> clad in the yellow stone. We can't clad this building in that stone because we, they can't afford to the cladding. We can only cast it. And I, I, at one point, presented to them the option of simplifying the geometry of the building as a way, by the way, to negotiate the fee. I said, if you want to negotiate the fee down, I'm going to stick with you, but we'll have to simplify the geometry of the building if we're going to lower the fee. And I'm, I've done architectures that are orthogonal, and I'm happy to do it. I showed them the other house. Fine with me. Oh, no, no. We want this form. You know, they really want these forms. So these forms have caught them uh, in a position where they can't have the materials they want. I mean, it's very interesting. They're kind of put into a position of wanting one thing that disallows another. Geometry is like that very often, I think. It disallows and allows it. It makes things non-negotiable. It's very interesting, actually. Mm -hmm. The resistances, when, you, when not everything is contingent, some things are demanded, even if arbitrarily, by their own um, the preservation of their own, their self uh, coherence. Something like that. Hopefully it will work in my favor in this case. <laughs> great. No, I still want to ask you this question about the way in which, uh, maybe, maybe we'll come back to it, in which uh, these geometrical relationships construct their own um, almost virtual geometries. Like if you if you look at something like the Sohn house and the way in which the position of the of the mirrors in the corner also reconstructs another version of the of the room, 
you don't have the geometry as something which is a which is an identifiable identifiable object or thing, which mm -hmm. is what you're saying with the what, what the clients like. But actually, there is a way in which there is a kind of visible geometry, and then there is a kind of other geometries or other other spatial situations that are constructed. And that's what I meant also when you look at the Guggenheim and the the slope or the way that the body interacts with the, spa with the space of the museum, there is also a different conception of the relation of the body to the work itself, which is instigated through the geometry. And this is why I was interested in, in, in the geometries that you're playing, and then when you say the, the, the dumb kind of gallery, the big spaces, whether there are ways in which there are other um, spatialities of, of, uh, of uh, of experience that uh, that well, th that the project constructs in relation to uh -huh. to the to the to the work. One of the examples one of the examples of that, which I don't show so well, and I should show more, which is that we have stairs sometimes and ramps sometimes moving mm -hmm. around that middle thing. I mean, I'm sure you can see it, but mm -hmm. and they alternate in a certain way. And of course, the, you know, the angle, the slope of the stairs is greater. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is though the inside has these sweeping voids mm -hmm. that are sloped. They're in an angle which is a compromise between the ramp and the stair. So as people move around that core, there will be times when they're running along the angle, almost where it will be, it, let's say, moving an angle more rapidly than the ramp they're on. Eventually, it'll rise over their head, the void. They'll return to a position of being able to look through it and on the stairs. Again, they will not be able to look in. So that bodies will, appear, so to speak, visitors, and pedestrians, <laughs> whatever you want to call them, bodies will appear and disappear because the geometry of this thing is, let's say, approximately aligned with the circulation, mm -hmm. but never unified, or, you know, it's, it's, it's this, this conjunctive relation mm -hmm. within it, in a very planned way, but one which means that people will be bobbing mm -hmm. up and down behind and appearing and disappearing. So there, I think this, it's interesting when mm -hmm. function or the fit, the fit that one might expect between patterns of movement and geometry is not fulfilled, or when mm -hmm. function isn't an immediate result of, or form isn't a contingent result of function, that mm -hmm. new experiences come mm -hmm. out of the kind that you're describing, I mm -hmm. hope. Okay, I'm sure there are some questions, maybe yep. like that. Could you just take the mic, please? Thanks. Um, Typically, as in the case of descriptive geometry, the geometry sort of resides in the technique, the way in which it's controlled, in other words, the drawing. Um, you talked about the, the form of the things that you're producing, but um, you said very little, really, about how you control and manipulate that, that form. Um, and I wondered if you could comment a bit more on that, and perhaps in the process, um, consider or explain w whether you see a distinction between form and geometry, in other words, sort of whether when a form becomes geometrical? Um, I would say the thing that probably the most focused on in many of those projects, not the Tel Aviv project, but all those other ones, just in the last ones included, is the intersection of certain um, surfaces, the, the lines of intersection. Those are very much the, that's what I'm thinking. I guess that the control of those, that the, that the surfaces are subject to bringing about certain, certain kinds of lineaments, it is what makes it like geometry, but not geometry. I mean, geometry is, in projective geometry, I mean, is completely a series of points that really, the lines are merely the connection between them, as you know. The, the next, of course, we have is uh, lines after yeah, points, and, and in our architecture, it's can't have lines without surfaces. Uh, so you're, you're moving away from geometry necessarily, I guess, the problem of architecture. The line is the close, is the, the, the point of contact between the two disciplines for me. It's the most obvious and the best point. I mean, so, sorry. so it's not the shape of the thing that is a, important. In a way, the shape, the cylinder, the, the surface, I mean, for example, in the earlier house, we had to make a surface that would not let the line loop back and intersect itself another way. I can show you, but it would make a figure eight unless we, you know, 
we basically, if you looked at that earlier, have a series of vaults because those are half cylinders, half elliptical cylinders. Cut off the bottom half of the ellipse and put plumb walls in. The plumb walls are what make the line close that way. So the reason I bring that up is that the it's the synthesis, uh, the disappearing of the, of the line by virtue of the, of the surface in which it is made manifest, by which it is made manifest, which uh, makes it move into the realm of form, but that retain the characters of the geometry. I mean, as you know, in geometry, a line can be infinite if, if we're not dealing with, if we're dealing with a point that is not in the system. Um, and in Arctic, we have no infinity. Again, this is a point that you cannot make sense. It, it's, an, it's a good question, by the way. I don't know how quite to answer it. Somehow I think the surface is simultaneously the surface of any of these forms, or these flat surfaces are simultaneously more like geometry because they're just the ether in which we, you know, in which we draw lines and points, and more like architecture because there's the substantive presence of things that we have to deal with, and the lines that go between. So in a way it is the drawing then. I hope the surface is something like the drawing, the plane, or the, the non-condition of the form. Yeah. Could you maybe pass on the mic? Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. Um, I was I was quite taken with the um, last series of images, the the sort of geomet geometric forms that you say you are currently exploring or about to explore. And I was quite taken with the comment you said about them that the two geometries that you've caused to intersect are actually somehow irreconcilable. And you, you said actually that when you make, that you actually have to fudge the forms to make them come together. And I was thinking, um, firstly, that, I mean, what I'm going to get to is I'd like you to sort of comment generally about that. But what I, what I was thinking um, was that arguably you could say the same thing about the project involving the light cannons in the church in Rome, the embrasures, where there's a kind of geometry to the outside which, and a geometry to the inside, and, and insofar as the exterior geometry is instantiated by architecture, it's in a sense irreconcilable with the one inside. And that that's, the, the relationship is then solved with more geometry, with the rotating of the, 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 the um, uh, geometry of the embrasures and such like. And I'm just wondering about coming to these last images that you showed, um, if the, well, first of all, I'm not sure really what it means that the geometries are not reconcilable. And I'm wondering if you then, you said you sort of, as a joke, kind of you have to fudge it the way buildings are frequently fudged. I'm just wondering if, if um, there's more geometry which would it, um, dwell between them, which would be how it's resolved, or if you perhaps maybe pull them apart a little bit more and there's a sense in which one could actually exist outside of two geometries or between two geometries or something. I mean, it just seemed like a very interesting condition, like we could be outside a geometry even if we weren't outside the form or something. I, I don't know. Right. Well, it either have to be literally a physical chasm, or a chasm, a void between the two, or you'd have to loft, something like that, which I resist doing. I mean, I loft. Yeah, you could loft right. between the two. For example, if you try to make an elliptical cone um, co-surfing, you know, have its surface join with the surface of the of the cross cap. Cut the cross mm. cap. You try to join the section of that to the section of a cone. It won't. It can't. You could get it very close. There, you, know, you can take an ellipsoid. You can take an ellipsoid, join it to a cone, and get a curve, a curve which is quite similar. I mean, to the to the eye. I mean, merely to the eye, by the way. I mean, they're never they're not similar. They're dissimilar. They're absolutely axiomatically dissimilar. So, <laughs> but the question is proportionate to the amount of surface and lineaments that one is working with. I mean, what I'd like to do is reduce the area of discrepancy to the, you know, to the smallest, you know, proportion. I mean, in other words, if there's literally this, there is a discrepancy, you can't even see it. The eye cannot see that the two curves are not coming together. I mean, it's really get in there close uh, from the point of view of, you know, visual assessment. From the point of view of a mathematical assessment, it's just not correct, period. <laughs> <laughs> Why not exaggerate that so well, you can inhabit it I, somehow? I, I, I mean. do like that. I understand. 
I mean, yeah, the exaggeration would just be the, cl the clash, either a clashing, you know, you could intersect literally a cone with a minimal surface, you know, and enjoy the linear intersection, which I do many times. But I would like there to be a point where the two are necessarily joined. If they're never joined, we're in the world of contests of between forms, which is, uh, for many reasons, not really that interesting. Although I like the discrete reality of the two geometries, or the discrete reality of two spaces in the toroidal universe, <laughs> the fact that there is unity in the thing that makes them apart stand apart is of interest to me too. That is, that surface in the torus is the thing that keeps them absolutely apart and absolutely together. Unless there is a point of absolute connection, it's not of interest to me. I mean, I'm not interested in things just fighting each other. It's not enough. It's insufficient. I like the fight and the resolution. I like the extreme, by the way, of both. It's total resolution and total clamorous contest, but never only one or the other. That's how I would answer. I don't like the middle ground, which would be the loft, which would be the kind of polite resolution. For <laughs> some reason, that was the one I don't really want. But I was lovely enough. Oh, all right, fair enough. I don't know. Why? Why? <laughs> maybe, maybe, it's maybe. all questionable. <laughs> maybe someone who knows the site. I'm sure there are a lot of people who know this site in Tel Aviv. Oh, yeah. They know get, get me ready. They're, hiding, they're hiding now. I can just see. <laughs> they maybe there could be I mean, some questions. I have to people. present this publicly in Tel Aviv for the first time. So how about somebody from Tel Aviv? Yeah. <laughs> ready me give for him, the give him, a, give him a Tel Aviv perspective. Because I'm actually curious about how this will be also perceived in the context of the, the phenomenal sort of history of, of, of modern of modernism in uh, in Israel. So I, I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that. Are you going to talk? Come on, you guys. How about back there? Do you have any the f the French perspective on uh, yes. on uh, oh, that on Tel Aviv? Useful. Can you definitely? Okay, right, there were two back the there. there. Yeah. The far back one and the middle ground, well, way back. You, yeah. yeah. So this is not about, uh, I'm not from Tel Aviv or France. No, 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 I was, okay. yeah. That's all right. Uh, <laughs> Can you speak <laughs> to the mic? I don't yeah, know what's um, Yeah. That's fair. I was interested, um, you talk a lot about surfaces and um, mathematical surfaces. Do you see a contradiction between uh, the abstract mathematical surface and surfaces that exist as boundaries of real objects? I mean, um, the surface as uh, like as it literally exists as the surface, um, the boundary of it. Sorry, am I back? Is that completely unclear? No, I do understand it. I guess that I hope this helps you. This may seem like a diversion, but I think the simplest way for me to answer would be to say that, for example, when you're dealing with a cylinder or a cone, the cone has an apex on one end, and on the other end, it could have any base. And a cylinder, of course, can be, it has no ending. It's no logical, there's nothing in here from a cylinder that's terminal. That's the conflict. You have to cut it. I don't know if that's, I mean, that's the point of conflict. The rest of it is fine. I mean, when you're the middle, of the, I mean, except for the end, the part of the cylinder that's there is not contradict. I don't understand it to have any, or to be any fundamental conflict your idea and represented. I mean, of course, it's a conflict between representation and, and you know, the platonic ideal of the geometry. Uh, I'm, leaving, I'm taking that for granted. The thing that I cannot take for granted, though, is the terminus of things not terminable. I, mean, I have to do it. That's an act that I have to take responsibility for. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 you know, the line, the linear representation Geometry, even not in architecture, already, uh, you know, not pure. I mean, as soon as we leave the realm of I mean, numerical description, we're already dealing with the problem of it. So I'm not, I can't, I can't deal with that. I can just do. <laughs> you understand? Okay. So there was one over here. Yeah. Um, you you did mention that you don't really want to add to the clutter of architectural <laughs> styles on the site, which is, and at the same time, uh, you don't seem really to relate to either of the buildings. I mean, I probably I agree with you with your, your comments about the, the, the plot of the opera project, even the whole project itself. But, and yet, 
the, the existing museum, I mean, uh, it's kind of uh, one of the only uh, pieces of architecture in Tel Aviv that has one uh, great consensus in, uh, in its quality. Uh, and yet, not in the geometry or um, kind of a structural organization does your project really relate to that. At least that's a good view. So how do you, like, on one, on one hand, you don't want to add to the clutter, but at least from the outside, it does look like another totally strange piece uh, that's not even related to the architectural history of Tel Aviv in any way. It doesn't look like that. Okay. Well, well, well first of all, the idea of relating the architectural history, it's always an indirect relation. I mean, for example, when that building was built, it related <laughs> in so far as it was part of a progressive architectural culture. Um, it didn't relate by being shaped like another building that already existed in Tel Aviv or anywhere else in Israel, necessarily. It was part of the tradition of the, you know, forward-looking modernist project. Um, now, as far as the relationship, you say either building, there are six buildings, so my either would have to be between, say, I would have to either mush together six files or make one side like one building and one side like <laughs> another. The idea that any building could really fit is not, is somewhat, I, I, I don't think that's, uh, the, it's a somewhat questionable premise that the idea of fit on that level. Now as far as the relationship, the thing that I was trying not to do though was to, it's very simple, which was to do what all the other newer buildings did post-1975, which is to exploit the, the, the multiple angles of the site. They all like show like, you know, an angled wall crashing into a 90 degree. Yeah, they're all trying to exploit the energy of the site. And that's the architectural interest that they're drawing on. The, the only the difference with my building, yes, it makes another different building, which, as I said a moment ago, is necessarily so, I think. I don't think any building wouldn't be but another building, which is not one of the ones that's there. Um, <laughs> but, um, this question of the clash, all I'm trying to do is to say that it would not do that. That seems to be the thing that makes this site evidently a collection of unrelated things, frankly. Um, or at least thematizes the idea of the, dis the unrelatedness of things. And that I wanted to not do. As far as, okay, now, my last thing I want to address. You must know the site. But mm. it does have a relationship to the existing building, which is very interesting. From my perspective, if you go inside the old building, first the old building is a pinwheel plan of four galleries around the central space. And they rotate around that space. That, that should ring a bell already. And the circulation from one to the other is very much like the way you circulate in this new building. In fact, it's the same kind of thing. You move from one to another around a central thing, and then there are ramps contiguous with that thing, only episodically. It's quite similar, conceptually, in my view, very, very indirectly. The fact that both are centrifugal <laughs> organizations makes them uh, siblings. They're not related visually. They're, they're, they're more like siblings than they are like twins or like, well, whatever. I don't know what I'm like to, to draw on here. But, um, I think actually they are related, yeah, oddly <coughs> enough, even though one, they can never be since this is a, as I said, in that triangle and the was other Was there one. any, like, uh, um, close here. I don't know what the, like, the, what you were actually asking in, in the competition, but uh, it seems like you have totally different uh, and autonomous, I mean, they're, as you said, similar maybe, uh, but autonomous uh, circulation paths. So between the two buildings? Between the two buildings. That's the old building. I wanted to add something, which is that the old <laughs> building is a pinwheel, which is an absolute, by the way, swastika yeah. organization. Um, <laughs> and you know in that kind of geometry, there's no way in. There's no point of entry that's logical to it. You, you would have to enter at the bottom in the center. You'd have to come in from under. There's no conceptually consistent way to enter a pinwheel plan, which is purely <laughs> It is utterly self-possessed and autonomous. Mm. The building is without any relation with anything. If you're going to talk about a building that has no relationship to its context, it's the original building, not mine. Mine, at least, <laughs> is twisting with the side. Yeah. No, seriously. And has its points of interest, log entrance logically related to other things that are already present. 
<laughs> but anyway, I couldn't in integrate myself with it except to extend from one of the circulation paths that arbitrarily emerges from it. That's a given, by the way, and I simply pick it up. It's uh, so across the back of the garden. Uh, some of the other architects came in and like, did these radical interventions, which I knew were prohibited. In fact, the, yard, the original architect one, Sue, is suing me right now and the museum <laughs> for doing this project. <laughs> for because they, you know no one can put their hands on a great master work by him, uh, and I didn't. I didn't touch it. So I don't know what he's suing me over, except that he apparently thought that it was his to have the new commission for the building um, by inheriting inheritance of some kind. I mean, it should be his. Whatever it has nothing to do with me. I have no idea whether he's right or wrong. Frankly. Well, maybe he's uh, maybe he's arguing since you're <laughs> you're saying. He doesn't have any context. Your building is creating an inappropriate context That's for right. his building, or something like that. Maybe yeah. after the fact. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Uh, thank there's you. Oh, okay. a question here, question there, question there. So if you could pass maybe Great. by the window. And if you could yes. then, because there are a lot of people, if you could just keep the questions brief, please. I think that would be nice. I'll, I'll brief it. Yeah. No, th see, there should be a red light. Yeah. What? All right. Um, you spoke in regard to a, to a question here in the front of, um, of not wanting to compromise, not being interested in, in the loft, right? And um, I can see in the Tel Aviv Museum, uh, in your design, um, to be bold, a lot of compromises in the way you present it. I mean, in, in different, in different um, let's say, the one is the compromises between the angles, very simple. Another compromise between um, somehow the stairs and the escalators. Of course, I understand of your uh, wanting to do this bubbling, wobbling action and to see it different, you know, that was every time. And um, and again, in the construction uh, that that you showed, in, in I see some sort of a compromise, um, which relates to another question in these columns which you say that according to, the, I, I know the very limited budget of the competition and the building, and these columns which don't really relate to the forms, to the very uh, developed forms, and it doesn't come from from these forms, it rather it's sort of put on it. And I would relate this in a different way to, um, to this compromise if we speak about Tel Aviv's um, uh, history and buildings to this compromise of bringing the international Bauhaus style in which in my mind your building it does give it, it does give back to this to this legacy in my mind I see a lot um, uh, giving back to the city and this compromise of bringing that style into Tel Aviv and what it changed um, because of Why course do you see it related to that kind of way? Why well for part of that yeah, first of all, uh, the, on the, vi the pure visual aspect of these openings, which from the, the international buildings in, in uh, Germany when moved to, uh, to Tel Aviv had to uh, move from these um, large window windows into a balconies which were going backwards and giving the shade, etc. Et and in your building also doing this um, coming, coming back of a form of the form giving light to the to the inside is actually in some way doing the same thing. So it's more a remark maybe than a question, but but I mean being from Israel <laughs> there's been a lot of compromising in in building and in techniques which have put some parts of the city into a general mess. <laughs> I mean, how do, you, how do you see your project well, I, in relation I, to that? You've got to understand the, the way I use the word or the context I use it in. I mean, I'm not using the word as broadly as you are. You're using the word compromise. No, no, no. I'm many, many, uh, all forms of compromise. I'm taking the extreme to make a point. Yeah. You're, you're taking a very broad view of the idea of compromise, which I, I'm very invested in the whole, the broad, in the broadest sense, I, I, compromise is the whole point in a way. But the, um, Compromise I was talking about is a very particular one that has to do with the discipline of the architect dealing with geometry only, exclusively and extremely narrowly. And what I'm saying is that when you do a loft, 
you are making easy and, and, and expedient something that otherwise would force you to invent or to or seek other solutions, it, it, it seems to me it's a compromise which is, you know, it, it's only necessary from the point of view of an architect who frankly is intellectually lazy, if I may put it bluntly. The other kinds of compromise are born in the opposite. I mean, those compromises you're talking about have to do with a deep investment looking for a solution the architect dealing with the narrow question of how to decide whether a corner should be that or that or whether the whole, or not just a corner. I mean, the, in the arbitrary world of forms that we deal with, um, it's, it's not the same kind of thing. That's what I'm saying. Okay. It's not a principle. Could you, could you give the mic to them? Yeah. Um, I'd like to go back to the question of um, Natural geometry. Um, it's, it's is your mic on? What kind of geometry? Um, I'd like to go back to the question of natural geometry. Um, it's been said that Renaissance architecture was a humanist architecture because um, the proportions related to the human body. For instance, um, uh, a Greek temple had a foot, a body, and a head. Uh, the tripartite elevation was on the basis of. Um, classical architecture, do you think when you have geometry which is as abstract and as self-referential as yours, you're in danger of producing an architecture which is post-human? Why is that a danger? The assumption <laughs> there is that, that ration, rationality is not human. I don't understand that. That's a peculiar of assumption. You're talking about symbolic, the, what constitutes the symbolic relationship between the human subject. And I would say they're different, that this relationship takes different forms, whether it's whether the basis is in mathematics or the basis is in a similitude of proportion. I mean, they're different or in a rational process of thought. I mean, there's so many. I, I don't know why this one is less or more, frankly. I would have thought it's too bound up in the old tradition of, of that, and that that's what you would object to, <laughs> to rather than that it's not bound up enough in it. Yes. Can we go here, here? Well, okay. all right. Well, can you be quick there, and then can, can we go here? Just yeah. no, no, no. Can we just the guy back? Yeah, uh, you go. Oh, yeah. Hold on. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you, 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 you. Yeah, sure. Well. Um, does the um, does algebraic geometry turn up in your work at all? I'm interested because um, you you made mention of uh, minimal surfaces, which to me are an algebraic concept, and um, aren't precisely the same or aren't simply um, joined to uh, the idea of um, descriptive geometry that you... They are not simply joined. Then They're not joinable. No. Yeah, and that's no. why I'm posing the question. Uh, yeah, no, I ha you know what? I have not really dealt with minimal surfaces. You know, it's the holy grail of architecture, maybe. <laughs> to be frank with you, as far as, uh, you know, I've only dealt with these three fragments. I mean, the, the triple point with the, the, the you know, I've never done anything like the coast of the you know, you need to really break them. I don't know what I'm going to do. Yeah. By the way. Can, um, <laughs> okay. It's working? No, it's not working. Yeah, um, perhaps I can just rephrase that earlier question. There, there is a, a, a second tradition which looks at geometry. Um, and I'm thinking here of the way, for example, Borromini's work has been interpreted, uh, San Cano al, al Quattro Fantani in Rome and so on, through Blunt and then through Alberto Perez Gomez, as though the geometry itself has some important ontological function as kind of being a bridge between the human and the divine. I'm not saying I support that, but it had, there is kind of seen to be some ethical uh, dimension to geometry and its role to play in situating the individual. Um, now your work seems to me to be purely kind of formal, as though there's no kind of ethical or other dimension to it. Maybe I'm wrong here. Uh, the only reference you made to that was that the swastika has somehow been an, a, a form that had something, a, a, a content grafted onto it. But are you simply sort of saying that for you, the role of this geometry is really to generate uh, complex, intriguing forms, or is there another, a deeper ontological dimension to it? Well, I guess I would add just to put it back to you, is the effect, is the effectiveness of the geometry, for example, in the manner in which 
it uh, creates uh, all sorts of anthropomorphic perceptions of space and of light transmission in the Baroque example and in many other Baroque churches. Not bound up with ethics? Should it be? Is it not already? Or where do you put that? Where do you put the architecture, for example, at that time? These would be your question. If we were only dealing with that, would you say the same thing that it's just form? No, I mean, I, I'm not no, I'm defending that position. Baroque statuses. I'm not defending that position, but that seems to be the standard position. There is a kind of ethical dimension to the geometry itself has this important role. It is, it's not just simply geometry per se. Do you think that's the case in that example, then possibly, for example? I'm just curious. Even though we can't say it's a, a symbolic shape like a swastika, we, do you imagine somehow that in the case of the faculty, because it's, for example, associated with the Trinity? Excuse me? The Trinity, yeah. Indirectly, there's no Trinitarian, there's no. Well, I'm thinking of Borromini's church there. Yes. And not the faculty I showed you, nor all the other faculties in Rome. They're all not all shaped, they're not all Trinitarianly shaped. <laughs> What's the word for it? <laughs> oh, they're not, they don't all assume that symbolic form, even though they're all part of the geometrical universe that other churches are situated in that are. So, what do you do with all of those? What do you do with all of the Ecclesiastical architecture, which isn't, isn't explicitly taking the shape, for example, of the Latin house cross. Do you consider all of it too to be merely geometry? No, but I'm just saying that there is such an important intellectual tradition which yeah. invests geometry with so much. Are you just. But what I'm saying is you can invest or disinvest. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can do that with a contemporary manifestation or one from that period. I, I, have, I don't believe I've either invested it or disinvested. The only other thing I would say, though, is that in a in a world in a modern world in which the the relationship of the subject to the to the work is more um, focused on the the reception of those forms, these are quite animated from the point of view of how the subject is engaged. For example, these inverse perspectives and distances collapsing and layering of space, and the subject moves up and down <laughs> next to an angle which seems dedicated to the movement that veers away from it. it. There's so many ways that, from a phenomenologist's perspective, this is very rich stuff. It's not just shape. Mm -hmm. It can all contingent all sorts of experiences. So I don't know if it's disconnected from the met metaphysics associated with geometry or not disinvested or invested. I don't know. But as far as these other things go, I think it's quite complicated. I would, have, I would have thought that going back to what you said about geometry and architecture, it's also that it's a form of, it's not just uh, ethical geometry, it's like uh, some form of ethical practice in, in the manner of the way you work through the thing. So yes. it is at the same, it's, at the, it's simultaneously working with the geometry that's also making the architecture. So that geometry is, 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 is inseparable from the experiential conditions of the museum. You so mean like, for example, just to put it really simply, you mean something, yeah. being true to the geometric principle, for example, is a kind of ethical position. Yes, but at the same time, I think because of the fact that you're being true to the, to the geometrical principle, but at the same time, that geometrical principle is, is implicated in, a, in an architectural project, the tension between the two is always at once geometrical, but at the same time, architectural and spatial. And so the integrity of the one actually affects the experiential conditions of the other. So you don't assign the ethical to the form, geometry, but you actually assign the ethical to the kind of practice with which the architect engages. And I think that that's just a, maybe a slightly different thing. I don't know. Can you take this mic? There are two people offering you mics. <laughs> you're, you're being shy. I think I think the, uh, my question is quite uh, similar as uh, reverse. Um, I think the uh, you take the very um, reductive manner to use surface as a tool to like represent the geometrical uh, continuity between the point and the volume. Um, it's very interesting if if you compare with a, an earlier modernist, uh, um, you know, um, they use like uh, also a reductive manner but to. Reductive. Earlier, you know, the modernist Early to use uh, yeah. um, reductive manner to use, um, you know, tectonic structure to represent the force through the structure and to represent the truth behind it. Then, um, 
my question is, do you have certain like meaning behind um, what your service, your service, um, why you do that? Is there any meaning? Or it's just pure form? Well, I guess I have to put it back to you again. I guess my question would be, if these forms do these things, the many, the several, the not many, I'll just say the several things that I said they do, uh, they, the, the way they move light and they elude the movement of the subject in space, they present conditions of space and distance and, and measure and experience in ways they sometimes are and sometimes are not, they, they do many things, are effects. I guess my question is, is, are effects meaningful or meaningless? Are all effects merely, are they meaningless? If they are meaningless, it's meaningless. That would be my answer. <laughs> now really, I, I can't ascribe a very kind of prescriptive way the meaning of effects, but I can only tell you there are many in it. <laughs> so it's up to you, I mean, I'm afraid. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> did, I, did I miss anyone in this? Oh. Room here. Did anybody want to ask a question? Because you're in the dark and I can't quite see. No? Very interesting. Is this? I mean, I'm not used to this. But it actually, you are as much a part of this as me, and yet I'm not. I mean, actually, I should really love so this. That's this a job. That's the a kind of thing that I'm really into. Actually, yes, I love. How many people have loved this? I mean, this is amazing. This is a bifurcated. Yeah. Yeah. With the thing at an angle, yes. <laughs> Where the main part is not there. Yeah. Yes, Homer. Yeah. Can you take a mic, Homer? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> no. no, no, no. This is just the sort of appreciation, really, of what you are putting forward, which I find so beautiful <laughs> and refreshing in in ways that um, it's a sort of a recollection of what was the role of geometry in making what are these effects central, r rather generative, rather than sort of using geometry. We, we are so perhaps familiar by now th with uh, using geometry as a sort of generation of diagrams which might excuse a certain kind of formation that uh, uh, well oh, the, it would be a sort of uh, generative tool for what is supposed to be experienced whether walking through or passing etc whereas here it's not to do with walking through but it affects walking through so the form of architecture is really the generative uh, dilemma created mm -hmm. which will then affect by the de definition how you might walk through or come in etc so in fact it the coming in might become a byproduct uh, or passing through which is uh, by definition entangled in a new problematic which is not predetermined by what is a, a description described by a diagram at the beginning Mm -hmm. So in some way, I find this so interestingly reversing what we sort of these days see uh, very commonly as the generative use of geometry in, in I the like diagram. I mean, of course, you're so interested right now, and this is, of course, what makes it wonderful to me. And when I commented on the very end when I said this audience is the occasion to talk about these things, because, I mean, you're invested in the process of the thought of making architecture. I mean, but that's what you're talking about, as opposed to the, you know, assignation of meaning, posteriori or a posteriori. I mean, I mean, I, I, it, the problem I guess I want to ask you back is, can architecture, is this, this inversion, for example, it's, it, it can't, well, it can't really be transmitted because one does not know that what came before the other in the world of the building itself. It's an interesting problem. I mean, what you're describing is the most beautiful thing about it, but it may or may not be manifest in the actuality of the building. Do you know what I mean? I mean, just as the diagram is not necessarily manifest, neither is this inversion, which is a beautiful inversion. I mean, I agree. Um, yeah, Does it ma Maybe it doesn't matter if it is. It doesn't have to be. Thank you. Good. I, I, no, I, I know. I think you're right. She's like, why are you asking me? <laughs> that you're right. Yeah, no, that's interesting. But it is exciting that it happens. And, and that the architectural processes of thought have happened is part of the history of architecture. The question is, in what context is that disseminated or is it made evident? Or 
transparent or is it ever? What, what you described in, in a by the way manner, uh, this yeah. kind of bob relationship of people seeing each other and bobbing uh, yeah. sort of places you cannot go up at angles which are not comfortable, et cetera, et cetera, are uh, pretty central to what is a byproduct of how you walk through. Right. Um, and it's a very difficult thing to imagine that you come up with that as a diagram, generated diagram. I see. So you're saying something about a very particular experience came about through the inversion. That's what is the, tr is the residue of this whole thing, rather than some Which is unpredictable, yeah. unspecifiable as a diagram to begin right. with. I, I agree. Uh, yeah, it's true. Can we, do we have a One of the reasons I, mean, I don't have very good diagrams of the project, actually. It's true. Like, I don't have a diagram of that. I don't like to diagram after the fact, you know, it's just boring. And yet you need to show people what you're doing. You know, to, it would be useful to have it to answer those questions. <laughs> um, yeah. Having said that, uh, I think one of the next questions would be, um, is it possible then to make some kind of uh, rule in geometry that allows spatial, um, yeah, the, 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 the spatial product. Yeah, I like this. <laughs> what, what do you all have in mind? Because you're, well, are you thinking about the minimal yeah, surface? The other way around, then. Have you worked with them? Yes, mm -hmm. you have. I'd like to see it, what you're doing. Fair yeah, enough. but go ahead. What, what are you trying to ask me? A rule that would do what? No, I, it, it, just do you think it's possible to actually be able to work the other way um, in a more, let's say, knowing what you're going to, like you can actually say, okay, I, I want to create these um, spatial, let's say, sensations mm -hmm. um, and go directly linearly, or as you're doing uh, through the geometry and then having them as a byproduct. Mm -hmm. So... It can the know. geometry also be yeah. a, a, a language for well, these what kind you're of looking for what I hear and which I all know is on the horizon of what I'm talking about is the fantasy is the hope is the utopia of geometry which is that it would do everything there would be finally a complete uh, synthesis where you could even carve out a space computationally or logarithmically that would correspond to everything necessary, for example, in a building or something like that, and, and also be still coherent geometrically. By the way, I don't think it, it, it's the horizon. The question is how far or near and proportionately how, where you are vis-a-vis -vis it. Because, for example, even if you did that, even if we go with something like George Lorapolis' work, which is extraordinary work in this area, by the way, you know, when he, and he talked about it, but I mean, the minute you have to deal with some of the very inexorable conditions of architecture, you're in violation. It's like somebody's going to, it's like parking violation. <laughs> like you put in a staircase. Uh, you know. There's no way to get the equation to generate a staircase while it's doing everything, you know, while it's remaining coherent on all of the other terms that it is. Inevitably, architecture is an intervention into the pure realm of geometry. It's some kind of intervention. It's some kind of negotiation, whatever you may want to call it, or utter contest, unresolvable, or put the clashing. And the question is where it, it, the scale, it, it, the point at which it occurs. Is it? Oh, sorry, that, that would be my answer to you. I like the horizon that you, I think you should go, by the way, I think you should go for it. I, I, no, really, I would try to get it to do everything. Go as far as you can go. That that would be my goal too. But if I, I wonder if I can handle the pressure to do it. I mean, what what makes <laughs> me, what makes me a bit nervous is when you refer to it as language, though, because I thought that a lot of the the, the, the whole emphasis of of the work is not developing, in a sense, a language in the in the in the tradition of a kind of uh, of a sort of uh, particular manner or style or. Uh, but it is actually a form of construction which is, you know, speculative. So I mean, it's just because the history of architectural discourse has been so bound up with language that the development of this kind of geometry, in some ways, is also a critique of the idea of architecture as language, in the sense of it being that kind of representational element. So it's a kind of critique of convention, or it's a critique of representation, in the sense of 
producing something and then assigning meaning to that, for example. One other thing I would say about the comment about language, I mean about the totalization of language or math, of a mathematical discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as this issue of where are you making it, is it the staircases that are added to an otherwise minimal surface geometry which is in no other way interfered with? Um, the other thing that I think is different about what I want to do, for example, take the Tel Aviv project, the middle of the building, let's say, is geometry, and the outside is geometry, and there's a kind of filler, which is these boxes, which is banal architectural stuff, let's say, but that's momentarily contiguous in a, in a meaningful way, <laughs> in, a, in a very explicit way by its generators with those ruled surfaces. The point I want to make is that it, if you deal with minimal surfaces the way we were just now ta talking about it, where you just put the stair in or something like that, the limit of the work is the boundary between the world and the work. It's just very literally the site limit or something like that. There's a point where the work stops and everything else picks up again. And the question is, where is it? Is it all inside? Is it digested by the work? Is it always outside the limit of a kind of spatial zone? Where, where, how do you deal with the boundary? your work and the autonomy of geometry and everything else. It's another, and spatially, I've tried to integrate that boundary. You know what I'm saying? It's inside, it's outside, it's everywhere. It's kind of interfering at different levels. As an excuse, there's a good alibi for be, you know, being weak need <laughs> about, about what would be impossible to do with geometry. You know, because I mean, it would be quite something if you had a minimal surface that made the middle of that building and it produced the galleries too. It went flat. It, that I would be willing to accomplish that kind of work. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, just a bit disappointing when you were talking about these two different structures just put on top of each other and that the structure wasn't, but anyways. Of the, of the, uh, you want the structure that's in the walls to also participate. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh. And, uh, well, anyway. it's not that, you know what, I made fun of it, I put it down, and you know, I shouldn't do that because if I said good things about it, you might feel better about it too. Um, I'm not going to do that again. Because it's actually, you know, something Rim would like be thrilled about doing, and he would affirm this kind of, you know, nonsense of stacking these things, you know, or something. I, I could give you a different tilt on it, and you might kind of like it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I've enjoyed it for other reasons, is what I've heard. But. Next year. Um, <laughs> this is a great audience, great, by the way. The great. best questions. I've never been in an audience where someone didn't only ask about how we're going to make the thing. I mean, that's the only kind of question I ever get. This is the, the first audience that has asked substantive questions. I'm completely being honest with you. This is quite exciting. Great. great. What is I also see. What's also wonderful for me personally is that you know, to kind of see this whole project um, starting maybe, I don't know, 1990 or 91. 96 I was here. Last I know, but I'm saying yeah. also when you started doing the kind of seminars at, uh, in, the, in the States at Harvard and teaching and having the studio and, and you know, the seminar and, and, and the thing that Hall was doing and just the whole fascination with, uh, with, the, with a lot of these works starting actually at a seminar level and to see that in kind of 12 years or 13 years, it's kind of grown to be context in Tel Aviv. I think that that's also something very extraordinary, so thank yeah, you. Homa, Homa brought uh, uh, this to my attention, this discipline. She's responsible for my first foray into it, literally, in 19, what was that, when, 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 did, when did it start? You brought this seminar into the, the program, right? It was 1990. So anyway, it's great to see the full circle back and be wonderful. here again wonderful. with you and the school. So. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay.